conversation with Hi everyone I am Khurshid Nariman a bronze sculptor from Delhi speaking on behalf of Art and Artisans It's my honor and pleasure today to introduce to everyone Devutam T Bose Devutam Bose is a project finance lawyer by training having worked in international law firms like Skadden Arps Slate Meger and Flom LLP London and White and Case LLP London as well He studied art history in London at the School of Oriental and African Studies SOAS and then went on to develop a niche consultancy with a focus on international art finance and philanthropy He divides his time between New York London Oxford Paris Delhi Mumbai Calcutta and Singapore Thank you so much for being with us today Devutham and it's such an honor Thank to you Krishi. very happy to be here and i i'm imagining covid has not been easy for someone like you since we've just heard all your world travels and where all you go and spend your time with but um, i just like to start with saying you know just your influences growing up and where did you study and why did you study and you know just sure sure um again you know delighted to be here thank you so much for doing this as well uh, for me also a great honor and to interact with so many different artists as well um, so my background has been um in terms of i grew up in india in calcutta that's where i am um the pandemic has all brought us back to our nests so uh, my grandmother's in in calcutta rest of the family so i'm here but um, otherwise i was based in london um and work was also uh, out of new york my education has been a uh, formative years onwards has been in the uk so i did part of my schooling in calcutta but the rest in uh, england and then i went on to study um something completely different international relations politics and law um, as any trajectory goes I was very keen to pursue it in different parts of the world. I was very lucky and privileged uh, to get a fantastic opportunity and and travel a lot because that was and is my foremost passion to travel, to imbibe culture, to understand, to interact. And and perhaps that was where the seeds of art and culture were, were sown. Uh, so I studied in England then I was very lucky to do my masters and I went to mainland Europe so I studied in Florence I studied in Strasbourg at a masters level and then I started uh, as a trainee um, uh, in the field of law uh, which I did uh, in London and that's when um, I had an inclination a strong inclination with arts and i was lucky enough to study part time at the school of oriental and african studies uh, so as but before that and that's an important thing i should mention is that i was working in india for a full year like a placement in, in mumbai uh, which was again uh, one of a very crucial year for me because that's when i really got to grips with what was happening in india it was a very exciting time I got to meet a lot of very interesting people and particularly a very dear friend of mine whose father was just collecting art he had just started his collection and it just so happened i was in the right time at the right place and he was a very kind man and he said you know they both them you're a budding lawyer why didn't you join me uh, when i'm going to see art and you know he was buying a lot of art and he was so kind and gracious he would say you know the weekends why don't you get on a flight and go and meet the artists from different part of india and let's commission them and one thing i was very particular even at that stage where i really had no idea about art law or anything was being transparent in my dealing and making sure that artists would get full fair price the market price um and that really started my journey into the world of art again i had no clue about law um it was just a question of me wearing a lawyer's hat understanding the importance of confidentiality understanding the importance of fair dealing 
uh, and uh, essentially making sure that a project completes uh, the responsibility part, you know, the buyer, the seller, the artist, etc. And, and, and that's it. Oh, that's fine. That's how it all started. Really. And for you, like you just said, you said that someone was very kind to you when you came to Bombay and that's how you really picked up. So other than that, gentlemen, do you have any other, say, influences or anybody else that's influenced you to maybe practice in this niche form? Because it's not very well versed or well heard of. You know, everybody, a lot of people do art and then ultimately drop it. And then maybe go into full-time law, or go into something else. So what made you, like you correctly said, all through your journey and travels and all, was there any pivotal point apart from this point that introducing to the artists or realizing that maybe artists don't get their fair share in the market? Was there anything else that really was the tipping point for you to make you go into that niche? Yes, it was actually. Um, as I said, you know, my passion for traveling and also people connecting with different types of people from different walks of life. One of the things I started doing was I was traveling again quite a lot. And, and this was especially in the uh, United States. So I would spend a lot of time in New York. I would spend a lot of time in Boston. I studied in Boston as well. And then I would spend some time in LA. So these are all very important art hubs. And I was very fortunate enough um, to meet some very influential, iconic, I would say, um, art curators and art historians um, who I got to spend a lot of time with. And I, I was able to essentially de facto apprentice with them. Um, I would spend time attend all the art fairs, the international art fairs, uh, both modern, contemporary, but antiquities. So I would do across um, all sectors, if I may say so. And the interaction with them, you know, that made a huge difference. So in the context of India, I got to meet people like uh, Dr. Sarya Doshi. Internationally, I got to meet like Dr. Kapanit Kapal and many other luminaries, including iconic art lawyers in New York, who would essentially do restitution work, work coming out of you know, stolen works of Nazi loot, which is very different. But the nuances of working as an art lawyer was slowly being developed. And I love the fact that, you know, how committed they were towards their clients and that it was a holistic advice. It was from start, whether a collector a buyer who's looking to buy art when the artist is no longer alive to another collector or an institution like a museum who's looking to commission an artist uh, for an important project, all the steps that goes towards. And I found that fascinating. And as I said, you know, the interaction. Um, so I said to myself that this certainly um, is a requirement in India because, you know, I was advising and, and helping this particular person uh, who's become very big and established a museum now. And I said, there is a need for independent advice where there is no conflict of interest. As a lawyer, you can carry on, um, let's say, a due diligence when you're buying a piece of art to establish a chain of ownership or a fair dealing with the artist or the artist struggling to receive payments or unfair terms uh, when they deal with certain galleries, um, or, or just giving uh, collectors, old time collectors, for looking to sell out their collection in a fair way, what their options are. So all of this I saw internationally in the US, in Europe, in London, these are important art markets, New York, London, Paris. Um, and I was very fortunate enough to spend a lot of time there with these very eminent people. Uh, and they were extremely kind uh, with their time. They would encourage me to travel with them and, and also meet very interesting fellow collectors who would host us at their beautiful homes. So that was an incredibly rich, immersive experience, both from collectors, both from academics and experts, and the artists themselves. So kind of all of that came together. And I kind of said, you know what? Um, you know, I have the legal training, I have the legal background now because I've worked in the law firms that you mentioned, Skadden Arts or White and Case, or in India Initiative Science, these are very well known law firms. Now, why don't I put this to a little bit of a very different and niche practice and establish what we understand as an art law practice in India? 
So could you tell us a little bit about how you go around deciphering fakes and forgeries in the art market? I'm sure spending time with all these, I mean, huge art names and like you correctly said, you've gone all over, you met curators, you've been to different shows. Is there any way that you would be able to decipher, say, a fake for, say, a new seller? Or how to go about that, or what you what it is in particular you look for. Yeah, again, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, this is a very important part of the work that I do, especially when the artist is no longer alive. And essentially, it's a two-step process that one has to uh, follow, I, and essentially it's a tick-the-box exercise. One is the provenance trade. So, for example, you know. Um, You've been trained under a very eminent uh, sculptor and artist. Let's say he was trained under a very well-known uh, sculptor called Ramping Parvej. Now, Ramping Parvej is no longer alive. Imagine, you know, uh, a collector, client of mine, uh, who wants to acquire a Ramping Parvej sculpture. Now, of course, he's very iconic, um, and the name is certainly very well known. But in terms of, for me to essentially meant to say that you know it, it is a genuine work of art what i need to first establish is the chain of ownership going right till ramkin barbet himself so who was the person who bought or was received as a gift or whatever it may be from the artist and that established the title of the work and that chain of ownership is very critical to establish the provenance and the authenticity of the work. The second thing that it comes hand in hand is the experts okay, who would have known Ramping Parvej's work or you know, are, let's say, important art historians or sculptors themselves. And my role here, and this is very important, confidentially, I would approach them and get their opinion. I would not disclose who they are because what happens usually in this is, let's say they give an opinion saying it's not genuine, then it's somebody's opinion. And then they can come under a lot of pressure. So as an art lawyer, I have essentially a team of experts. So if it's a straightforward, uh, let's say to authenticate, then you just need one expert opinion. But if it's complicated, you might need three or five or eight, and then it's essentially the majority, who's, depending on the complication, depending on the value of the work, et cetera, et cetera, it hasn't been published. All of that comes in, but it is, they both go hand in hand. So if the experts only say, oh, it's genuine, and if the provenance trail is incomplete, that's not good enough. You can never be sure. If the provenance trail is complete, that goes a long way to establish authenticity. Uh, and then, of course, the experts can come as a secondary source to augment that what you've established, yes, it has come from a direct source linking to the artist, even if she was operating, let's say, you know, 100 years ago. That sounds really tedious, though. My God. Yeah, going around and... Yes, it's very investigative yeah, in nature. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. What would you say so far has been like your hardest case to date? Just as an update, because the way you're going, if someone, if there's an artist that passed away, and sometimes, you know, you know that artists grew up in the art market, the more the exchange of hands, and the more the exchange of hands of even artwork has gone across. What would you see has been your most challenging, I think, case to date, and how did you, like, crack it? <laughs> you know. Yes, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I get to, uh, especially when, you know, collectors, it, it's an international practice. So you, know, you would have collectors who are, let's say, based in Chicago or New York or London, and they're acquiring high value works of art. And they rely a lot on their advisors and professionals. And so when I get involved, you know, my job is to come, and as I said, it's very investigative in nature. Um, perhaps um, recently, um, I, I was uh, instructed to work on uh, some works by you know, very well-known artists, they were no longer alive. One of them is Manjit Bawa. And um, the particular um, seller was using different um, corporate structures to hide the actual uh, owners of the artwork. And this particular client uh, who was based abroad 
absolutely loved um, the artworks. And uh, they were iconic pieces, beautiful works. And um, she wanted to buy them. And then eventually, uh, and this happens a lot in the US, um, they gift to the museums. And there are a lot of benefits as well that you get um, and when you give to museums. So that was the overall band-aid that they would buy for themselves and then would eventually give it to an important collection in the museum. So when I came on board and I was doing the due diligence, I uh, saw the works, they wouldn't reveal who the actual owners of the works were. There was a corporate entity, they had all the paperwork, the mandate to sell, there were genuine works, there were, there were no issue with the works, um, also in terms of the authenticity, but they wanted to remain anonymous. And which happens a lot in the art world, people want to remain anonymous, and I can understand that. But from, and here's a differentiation between a gallerist or a dealer and an art lawyer. Art lawyer requires full disclosure. That information stays with the art lawyer, but it is in the interest of the due diligence that a full disclosure is required. So when I did my due diligence, I was shocked, but wasn't that shocked to be honest with you to find out. They were coming from a collection of the Melinda Saints where there were very specific court orders right up to the Supreme Court that they could not sell their personal assets because um, you know, essentially of the, the fraud that had taken place. Of course, my clients were not aware of any of this and they were they had absolutely fallen in love with the beautiful work and that's for sale. So once I found all that out, I had a very tough time to explain to them that uh, this would come back to haunt them. And I completely advise against the sale uh, because it is really not worth it. It's against the law, even if it's a private purchase, even if they have created shelf companies to protect, it is not, a full protection, they're exposing themselves. And most importantly, this, will, this is going to go to a public uh, institution and that's a risk to them. So that was a challenge uh, to explain to them and, and kind of reset their expectation. Uh, but that's, that's what happened. That's again, a differentiation uh, from any dealer or uh, yeah, anyone. There's no conflict of interest from a lawyer's point of view. You have to give independent advice. No, that's fascinating. Also, like you're India's first art lawyer. So is there any advice that you would give to young aspiring lawyers who might want to get into this field as well? Plus others, yes. which is... Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I have a, a very funny anecdote to share, um, which includes um, um, your father, Justice Nariman. This was at the time he was the attorney general and uh, a good friend of his had brought me to his chambers and uh, I just started the practice. And he very humorously said, oh, from the art of law to the law of arts. So I always remember this. And yes, you know, I, I started this out, in, uh, you know, of course I got this as a India's first art lawyer. And I've been very lucky to interact with fantastic um, young lawyers who come and they've interned with me. And I always say to them, it's the first thing is they have to become a lawyer first. They have to train as a lawyer. They need to understand uh, what a lawyer means, you know, work both in litigation, contentious work and non-contentious work. So they get a full idea. And once they have a substantial years of experience behind them, and of course they're passionate about art, you know, pursue um, a lot. There are lots of part-time courses on art history available. It's, 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 it's good to have a, art history background, that the aesthetics helps and aesthetic eye helps. And then of course, you know, train uh, under uh, a senior who, who pursues art law. Right now I have um, some very senior lawyers who worked in very well-known law firms and they've now joined my practice essentially to um, learn and, and eventually go into this area. But they all come with, you know, over 10 years of um, experience working as lawyers 
and, and that's what I would say to young adult uh, lawyers who want to go into the art law field. Uh, you okay. need to have a holistic idea uh, about I law agree. and contracts, mm -hmm. and, and then you know see the bigger picture, and then you pick up things as you go along. And you know, for a lot of people nowadays, they want to just learn about art. Learn about upcoming yeah. art, about artists, and people want to start collecting, but they don't know where to go to, or which sources, or what strategies to employ. Are there any platforms that you'd recommend to even people who are just interested in the arts, not necessarily for buying? And of course, for people sure. who want to start their art collection as well, just how to go about it and where to start. Absolutely, you know. Um, again, with a lot of uh, now. I always mention this to a lot of my friends, and thankfully, all of my friends have gone into collecting art. Yeah. And I mentioned to them that, look, you know, in a year, uh, whether you're married or not, there'll be one important date time that you're going to be treating yourself, be it your birthday, be it for any festivities, etc. And if you love art, get in a habit of buying one piece. Um, you know, it doesn't matter about the price tag. It's just about appreciating something and living with it at your home or putting it up in your office. But invest a little time. And you're right in saying is that's the key thing. You know, spending that time. Uh, I mean, especially now in the pandemic, a lot of these resources are online. But pre-pandemic, when we would have this discussion, I would encourage people to go to the museums, you know, whichever city they are. Um, you know, whether in India or, or abroad, they're fantastic museums uh, and with such great collections. Go and see yourself, you know, immerse yourself, attend um, art fairs, you know, attend events where you get to interact with artists, you know, talk to them, understand their journey. That's how I started my journey, you know, when my friend's father was essentially uh, encouraging me and, and we were commissioning artists. I would go and spend weekends with eminent artists and, and spend hours with them, understanding, you know, their journey, how they got into the world of art, and what inspired them. And they love that. They love to share their journey and story. Um, so similarly, you know, I would say this to any budding collector, especially with um, artists uh, who are alive. Go and spend some time with them. Understand their journey. Um, and that will give you an interest. You don't need to go and buy art straight away. Um, but artists, and I, I genuinely believe this, um, and I believe in this saying, there is no such thing as art, but artists. You know, And every artist's perspective is really interesting. And understanding uh, that world is you do that when you get to interact with that artist. Uh, and there's so many opportunities now, especially in the world of pandemic, you know, you can interact. People have got used to interacting virtually. Um, you know, Luke just recently announced the entire collection to be made online. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, you know, the, the, the resources. You know, Instagram has become such an incredible online gallery. Um, you know, you get to see such incredible quality of images and, and, and great narration, um, you know, people kind of semi-curate, um, and, and so there, there's just a lot of ways. And then, of course, you know, whatever budget you have, of course, if you're lucky enough to spend serious money, then I would say get professional advice. It is very important because, sadly, when it comes to master painters and artists, um, it is a, a serious business and, and a lot of money gets changed. And as a result, the fakes and forgeries and stolen work of art are rampant. And it's very difficult for, let's say, common people to just, uh, lay, lay people rather, to just decipher whether it's you know, genuine or not. So, but, you know, whatever is your budget, yeah, uh, it's important to do that. Take, and take the time. Yeah. Really, that's it. And uh, lastly, do you have any words for young artists on how to handle their artworks legally? Yes, I think with artists, I would absolutely recommend that to get to know a little bit about their rights. You know, um, also remember that it is a marathon. Uh, you know, they're going to have an incredible journey ahead of themselves. And relationship is sacrosanct. So never burn any bridges. 
um, be it with any galleries, be it with any curators, be it with any art advisors, but equally understand that you know it is a business world and they might need professional help. It's important. If you're very established, then it's in the importance of a catalog resume. If you're just starting out, having uh, you know just the just the opportunity to interact with various people from the art world is worthwhile. Interacting, um, doing the research, attending, um, you know, getting your works published and, and getting your work exhibited it is the key thing. Really. Um, and, and, and essentially, um, just understand that this is a, a long-term journey and, and to enjoy it. Thank you so much. So thank you, Devadam, for being with us today and for your great advice Pleasure. and words of knowledge. So I hope anybody who views this takes up tips and he's very accessible. So please go and talk to him anytime you want to as well. So yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so a much. pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you.